Thank you, Michelle. Our next speaker is Sean Cozen, a real alive FDA employee. He's the acting associate uh, director at FDA's newly formed Oncology Center of Excellence and founder of Informed, which you will hear about, an incubator for collaborative oncology regulatory science research focused on innovations that enhance FDA's mission of promoting uh, the public's health. Uh, drawing from the expertise of oncologists, data scientists, statisticians, and entrepreneurs and residents, asterisk there, entrepreneurs and residents at the FDA, Informed is expanding organizational and technical infrastructure for big data analytics while approaching these modern uh, challenges for evidence generation and analysis. Previously, Sean was in private practice in New York City. He was also an entrepreneur in building health information technology systems. Uh, he's a little bit of a or quite a bit of a modern jazz uh, musician and guitar player. I'm not sure if we've been listening to his work, but maybe we were. Uh, his title is What is Regulatory Science? Please join me in welcoming Sean. Thank you, Russ, for the great introduction, and it's uh, great to be here. Uh, so as Russ mentioned, the topic of my presentation is regulatory science. And um, if you asked me that question when I started working at the FDA in 2012, not long ago, I would tell you, well, I have no idea. And I really didn't, um, even after I got the job. And I kind of felt like an imposter because I thought regulatory science was the bread and butter of what uh, folks did at the FDA. So I started asking the question from my colleagues, and I got a lot of thoughtful answers, but I got a lot of different answers, and there seemed to be no consensus on what regulatory science is and what it can be. So I started to uh, dig in a little deeper and try to think about a framework that can um, combine and include everything that we do under the umbrella of regulatory science research. So if you ask me the same question today in 2017, I would tell you I may have an idea of what regulatory science is. I'm still not sure, but I may have an idea. And I'm going to talk to you about that journey uh, today. And actually, my journey looked more like that, but I'm not going to bore you with the details. Russ told me I only have 10 minutes, so I'm going to be quick. I'm also going to tell you this story in reverse sequence. Uh, for those of you who've seen the movie Memento, you know uh, what I mean. So here's the final act. Uh, regulatory science is system science. It's really uh, about regulating systems. And you can regulate systems through a variety of different means. Policy and rulemaking are just um, some ways that it can regulate systems. It can regulate systems through education, uh, through dissemination of information, and through injection of incentives into uh, the ecosystem that you're trying to uh, regulate. So thinking of it that way, regulatory science is really focused on where we are now uh, to uh, where we should be, where we should be going. And that transition is in the domain of regulatory science. So regulatory science, in essence, is translational research in a lot of cases. So where are we now? Uh, if we look at where we are now in this uh, expanding universe of big data along the four dimensions that we're all very familiar with, volume, variety, veracity, and um, velocity. Uh, so currently at the FDA, we're looking at clinical trials to make our regulatory decisions. And these are databases that, in terms of veracity, are mostly structured and, and standardized. And in terms of volume, no more than a few gigabytes. And in terms of velocity, how frequently we're analyzing the data, we're getting the data intermittently. Essentially, when uh, the sponsor of the study submits a new drug application or a new uh, biologic licensing application, we get the data, we analyze it intermittently to make our regulatory decision. Um, however, the expansion of the universe of big data is really urging us to go beyond that. And we need to really start to look at electronic health record data for making regulatory decisions. Uh, we need to look at social, uh, video, sensors, and wearables, and omics, and not just genomics, but the protein and the microbiome that you heard um, heard about uh, earlier today, uh, all of those uh, factors have to play a, uh, an instrumental role about making regulatory decisions about the safety and effectiveness of therapies that we regulate. And when we do that, uh, we enter a new world where uh, the veracity of data is very complex and undefined, volume, petabytes, and more. However, if we do it right, we can have a real-time feed into how patients are responding to the therapies that we regulate, at least a near-time feed into the realities of 
uh, of uh, drug development and how patients, more importantly, respond. So thinking of it that way, regulatory science is really the force that can take us from a reductionist uh, approach to drug development, you know, one gene, one drug, uh, for example, to this holistic edge of the expanding universe of big data. And that uh, force uh, is really what regulatory science is. So here's a traditional view of drug development. Uh, many of us are familiar with this. It's very linear and it's siloed in different distinct, into different distinct phases. So we have the preclinical phase where we do our um, lab studies and in vitro studies, and then uh, we do our animal studies uh, before we take the drug to the clinic. Uh, and then there's a clinical phase where we do randomized clinical trials as a gold standard. And if the drug is approved, we're lucky, then there's a post-market phase, which uh, there may be commitments or requirements that uh, provide more data about the safety and effectiveness of the drug or the device that's on the market. So what is the systems view of this world? Well, it's not as linear. And when you look at it from the systems uh, science perspective, the lines start to blur. Uh, we are already using systems biology approaches to blur the line between preclinical and the clinical phase. And by doing that, we can take patient outcome data from clinical trials, feed it back into uh, the preclinical phase of drug development to build more predictive models. And if we do this right, we can, in fact, uh, do completely in silico preclinical studies without the need to even uh, uh, do any animal studies. And the um, transition between the clinical to, to the post-market phase from a systems perspective is what uh, Dr. Topol uh, mentioned earlier today. It's the learning health system uh, where we will uh, start to look at electronic health record data and other real-world data pipelines to really narrow the gap between discovery, research, and healthcare delivery. We should be able to, given the technologies that we have, extract data from the point of care to make our regulatory decisions and to really use that as a vehicle for doing clinical research. You know, the randomized uh, clinical trial enterprise uh, is a very old enterprise. It, it, it is nearly three centuries old, and we have now technologies and tools that can allow us not to eliminate randomized clinical studies, but to bring them to uh, the real world, to the point of care. And we can also take the systems view even a step further. And when we do that, we can start to think about how we can optimize societal investments and national priorities in biomedical research. The NIH invests uh, $25 billion a year in biomedical research on basic science research. Uh, there are a lot of private in, uh, investments that do go into drug development. And we really need to think about, from a systems perspective, how to best optimize these investments. Uh, because when you think about it, when a clinical trial fails, nobody wins. Uh, the investors certainly don't win. Uh, the sponsors of these clinical studies don't win. Th th those are pretty obvious. But more importantly, patients don't win. Uh, we're exposing patients to ineffective therapies and therapies that uh, may fail. And as a public health agency, we have to be able to uh, reduce that, reduce the risk to the patient, to be able to uh, participate in, in research studies that have the highest likelihood of uh, success. So de-risking these investments and clinical development programs is part of what we should be doing. And the Simpsons system's view of, of that would be through game theory, and really mapping out the game th theory of drug development so we can allow everyone in, in uh, the ecosystem to make rational decisions and uh, to reduce information asymmetry. And we have a very unique vantage point uh, and point of view at the FDA we get a lot of data. We actually know what works, what doesn't work, what is hype, and what is not hype. And th uh, by having a systematic, uh, systematic approach to mapping out the game theory and uh, sharing that information with the community, we can start to enable and facilitate rational decision making in drug development. So here's Act One of the story and uh, the um, initiative that uh, Russ mentioned, information exchange and data transformation, which really allowed me to start thinking about a lot of these issues. So this is a holistic approach to oncology regulatory science. It's a program that we launched uh, a little over uh, a year ago, and it has been very productive and has been scaling very quickly. It's very different than uh, a lot of efforts uh, that you may hear about at, at the FDA. This is uh, an incubator, and basically it has two different components. 
uh, we are aggregating, aggregating all the clinical trial data we have uh, and doing meta-analyses. Uh, we've published uh, a lot of this work. Some of the predictive analytics that we do are being used to generate insights internally to, make, uh, to inform regulatory decisions. The other component of the program is uh, really exploring novel pipelines. Uh, of data for regulatory decision making. And this includes real world data, uh, sensors, but also the internet of things to get environmental uh, data on, on patients uh, receiving therapies that we regulate. And we're looking at a uh, complex multi-omic milieu for making regulatory decisions that goes just uh, beyond genomics and includes uh, data from the, the proteome and the microbiome. And again, things that you heard today. And we have a growing portfolio of uh, regulatory science initiatives. A lot of these are actually uh, partnerships with academia and in some cases the private sector to uh, start to answer these questions on the ground. And uh, the way that we're doing it uh, is we've been able to recruit uh, through volunteers, uh, volunteer staff that we already have at the uh, FTA, uh, hematology oncologists, statisticians and data scientists, but also new blood that we've been able to bring uh, engineers and entrepreneurs and residents through a hiring authority uh, that we received from HHS who are looking at data and what we do in a completely different way. And um, uh, by doing that, we've been very, very productive. Uh, and we're really combining that with a strategy that's based on systems thinking and game theory to identify leverage points in the system where through regulatory science we can have um, a substantial impact. So um, I'd like to conclude by saying what's obvious to everyone here. And, uh, and this is the fact that the tech revolution is already here, but as they say, it's just not evenly distributed. So a lot of us, not just at the FDA, but in the life sciences in general, are trying to adapt and, and catch up to this expanding uh, universe of big data. And, uh, and research is really an outcome of the technology revolution. Um, and I think system thinking can allow us to do that and to uh, adapt more efficiently. But more importantly, if we adopt a culture uh, that is collaborative and, in, and incorporates uh, a system's view of the world uh, when it comes to uh, decisions, the types of decisions that the FDA makes, we can really prepare ourselves for the post-tech revolution, which is already emerging. And we have actually touched on, on, on that today. And the post, in the post-tech world, uh, it's a world uh, that really hardware and apps have little to no value. And it's really big data and algorithms that are driving the show. Uh, thank you.